This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Sean Brawley about the inner game, dealing with blocks and resistance, and growing your capacity. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Sean Brawley. Sean has dedicated the past 25 years to helping people from all walks of life elevate their performance and unlock their potential. As founder of the Brawley Institute, Sean is one of the world's foremost experts on innovative coaching methods and sustainable high performance. He has custom designed programs for GE, ITT, New York Yankees, and USC football team. And it's my great pleasure to have Sean with us today on the podcast. So welcome, Sean. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, James. So share with everyone what's going on in your world just now. Well, there's uh, some exciting projects. Uh, I'd say that the two that I'd like to, well, two or three I'd like to share is uh, I've got two projects with Wilson Racket Sports. Uh, in March, I um, I had the just a dream assignment, James, of interviewing the top tennis players in the world who are under contract with Wilson. <laughs> that included uh, Roger Federer, Venus Williams, Grigor Dimitrov and uh, uh, Simona Halep, who got to the finals of the French Open, and, and about uh, ten other uh, ten other pros, and that that those interviews are going to uh, post actually starting next week um, on the Wilson website, Wilson.com. And uh, there, I discovered two patterns in in uh, that project and in, in interviewing them that I think, um, given that your uh, your your uh, audiences, the you know, creative types that um, that they might be interested in. So perhaps we can circle back to that. And then a second project with Wilson is uh, I've developed a curriculum that, that uh, is is a um, very simple and effective approach that um, it looks like they're going to use as a platform for uh, their first ever coach education program. So those are two two uh, pretty I'm um, pretty two projects I'm very excited about, and then lastly I I've had a project a two year project with one of the a national restaurant chain <clears throat> that um, um, they put in process a sim- similar to my tennis curriculum they put in a, a a process of just really simply focusing on the most critical elements and building trusting relationships and uh, it's been really gratifying to see not only the performance uh, triple in and their stock price is at an all-time high but the global leadership team is uh, exhibiting collaborative uh, leadership um, behaviors and just having a much more meaningful life I've actually got them to meditate on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> So that first one you're talking about there with the interviews, I mean, that must be fascinating to interview all these really kind of top performers. And you mentioned like noticing patterns. So what were the, what were the patterns that you noticed amongst these these top uh, performers, and how can how can that be applied into people that maybe tennis is not their 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 job? That's not their thing, but maybe they come from business or they come from the creative industries, for example. Yeah, no, I think it. Uh, totally relates. I'm still, it's still new and I'm still reflecting on it and, and how to present it. But, um, um, but there's two patterns. First is all, uh, 14 of the people that I interviewed. And just to remember, they're pretty much all ranked in the top 20 in the world. I would say at least half of them are, um, you know, in the top 10. And so these people made it. So there's a number of people where um, who may have exhibited some of you know the first pattern, but then they ultimately didn't make it. The first pattern is what I just simply call breakthrough. That all of them had a match or a tournament where they called would define it as a breakthrough, where <clears throat> where just something about like it's as if they were ripe 
with potential and then they came to that match and then what transpired in the match just totally transformed how they saw themselves, how they felt about themselves and the their mind opened up to the possibility of, wow, I, I can, I can do this. Like, this is possible. I can, I can actually be one of the best tennis players in the world. And of course, Roger Federer and Venus Williams, they became number one in the world. So, and, and not, they weren't always about winning. So like two or three of the pros uh, actually lost against like, uh, Gail Monfils is the top French player and he's ranked in the top 10 in the world. Um, and he lost in three sets to Andre Agassi and the same kind of experience happened for him. Mm. Now, now here's where it gets interesting is that nine of the 14 players within three weeks, to about two months, let's say, after the breakthrough experience, they got severely injured. And when I was interviewing them, you know, they, of course, talked about it as being a very difficult time. It was tough to be away from tennis. It was terrible that it happened after such a, you know, wonderful, mind-blowing experience. Um... And then when I was interviewing, I was interviewing Madison Keys, and a little, you could call the little creative voice, um, just intuitive voice, said, what if it was a gift? So I asked Madison, I said, Madison, I hear how difficult this was for you, but, uh, you know, I have a strange question to ask you. Just go with it. Um, what if this was a gift? It, what, what, what was the gift and what did it teach you? And she actually lit up. She sat up. She got a big smile on her face. And she, her answers pretty much matched everyone else's answers, which, uh, number one, uh, she had time to reflect on what had happened. Number two, she had time to assimilate this new world that she was going to be operating in. Uh, it was going to be different tournaments, different level of tournaments, different money, just a lot of things would, would change. And it allowed her some time to assimilate that. And then here, the, the last two, I think, are what are really important for the process, which is um, this was the first time she and the others had not voluntarily stopped playing tennis. So this was a, like a forced break. And so they all described it as like a mini death or a mini loss or a great loss. And um, and that this this forced uh, time off um, brought them back home inside to how deeply meaningful tennis was in their life. That it was like the reason for their you know, it was their purpose. It was the reason why they would wake up every single morning. So to not be able to do that really put them in touch with that. And then lastly, um, as almost like a flowering of, of the, what I previously said, um, they also talked about it, put them in, back in touch with just the simple, pure joy of hitting a tennis ball that they had when they were uh, just starting to play when they were kids. And, and so this has become fascinating for me, and I'm researching you know, in other sports, and you know, I've reflected on it. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of people who are involved in, you know, the creative process or, you know, entrepreneurs growing a business, you know, there's there's two main blocks, I think. There, there, there's m many blocks we could talk about, but there's two main blocks. One is you're just stuck. Like you're trying to go forward, but you can't move. There's something in you that just prevents you from taking action. It, it could be any number of things, but generally it ends up you know, ultimately being fear. The other way that I found that is often overlooked because the other blocks are so, you know, more prevalent and, and easily accessible and understandable. The other block is who you think you are and what you believe about yourself. And ultimately that is how far you can go. Like how, how you see yourself. So the fact that they had like a match that they won or Juan Del Potro, number one from Argentina, is the only pro that beat 
Rafael Nadal or Federer in the same tournament, the U.S. Open. And then, you know, mysteriously, two months later, he hurt his right wrist, and then he's out for like a year and a half, you know? I mean, it's unbelievable when I discovered this. It's like, it's almost like clockwork. It's unbelievable. And what I and what they also described is after the breakthrough event, they felt this tremendous internal pressure. And I think that that tremendous internal pressure, James, is the like they're shown what's possible. So mm. their idea of themselves expands. But then the reality is they really are still seeing themselves uh, and believing their belief system hasn't changed yet. So that time off and that, that those that those four th things that they you know they all said I think is it's like the injury is a relief valve and is and it gave them time to actually embody this new person and then once they could do that then they were on their way and the and the injury actually ended up playing no part at all in their rise. That's absolutely. F I mean that's so fascinating as you as you as you tell those those stories and those um those things that you would notice those patterns you know as you say you know that success leaves clues and all these people have been incredibly successful at, at, at what they do and there's, there's there's clues within there um it, it does make me think as you were talking about that where they've all had that experience of of that the the kind of breakthrough which they've had when they've been severely injured and then kind of going into the that sense of mid death of, of, of a, a kind of a death like almost like a death like experience and the discovery of that the what the find what the gift is from it and then discovering the joy of kind of that starting again that beginner's mind and doing it and then feeling that you know that that internal pressure it reminds me in some ways of it's a classic hero story isn't it you know when you, oh, when you think about time. that you think Just, you think of absolutely. all those great movies you've ever watched and it's that that point you know and it's going along and the person's building very successful but it's that you know you mentioned those little blocks and you lots of little blocks along the way but then there's that paradigm shift that transformation that something something happens um but i'm guessing for some people that that thing will happen that main main momentous moment will happen but they won't come out the other side. Um, did you have any kind of sense, like from the day, because you obviously, you work with so many top athletes as well. Those people that that thing has happened to, but they weren't able to use it as a, as a gift, but, and they, they turned it into something else. Yes. I, I'm, I mean, just sticking with tennis, um, Tracy Austin was number one and won the U S open. And then shortly thereafter got injured and then she had a comeback. I actually happen to know her personally. So not many people realize that on her comeback, she was at a restaurant and a waiter dumped, uh, a, a, a whole pot of hot water on her and, and burned her. And so, you know, she wasn't able to come back, and and Mark Mark Philippoussis is another one that just comes to mind. He's was a number one Australian player who who got to the finals of Wimbledon and almost won, and then shortly thereafter got injured and never came back. So without talking to them, I can't, I don't know. But you know, just from my whole, I mean, I've spent my whole adult life in human development, and you know, both myself and sports and life and and business and my guess would be is that they didn't you know grace didn't visit them they didn't like i'm not sure you can manufacture that process i mean it sounded like it was such a natural process for them to get the gift out of the wound and by the way since you said the hero's journey that's a common uh, a theme in mythology or the hero's journey is getting the gold out of the wound or getting yeah. the gold out of the the uh, injury or the the um you know the the difficulty and so that is absolutely one of the messages is to sh you know if you go into victim mode then you have no chance of getting that gold but if you can re if you know this then you can you can look for it but how can how how can mere mortals <laughs> like us people that aren't doing that and and maybe you know that that thing doesn't happen that 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 incident that accident that the injury doesn't happen um 
are there ways that we can almost create some of those things in our lives in order to kind of almost imitate that? And I'm thinking here um, at West Point, they teach uh, Seneca, they teach Stoic philosophy. And there's a thing that Seneca always says, which is like at least once a year, spend a couple of days where you live, you wear the spot, you know, the, the most basic of clothes, eat the most basic of foods and live and, and basically ask yourself after you've gone through those three days, is this what I fear? Is this, the, if this is the worst it's going to get, how bad is this? And it mm. kind of makes people kind of push maybe on because they, they feel a bit more emboldened as well. So for the, the mm. people that you are, are, do you think, are there ways, uh, whether you're a performer, or as an entrepreneur or a business person, that you can take some of those things? You don't necessarily have to have a big injury, but are there things that we can maybe imitate or, or strategies that we can use in order to have that similar type of process? Or does that just have to happen? It's just luck. Um, well, you know, it's a good question. It's a great inquiry. And to be honest, like, for instance, I actually, it's so new that, like, with these injuries, I, I honestly do not know whether, like, you c can create a developmental process where the injury doesn't happen. I, I'm not, I actually am not sure. Like, the injury almost is like a gift mm -hmm. for them. So the, that's the question I'm asking. And I, I think the answer is yes. I think... That what I'm all about is, is without going into too much detail, um, you know, we operate in the coaching world, both sports coaching and business coaching, life coaching, all of it, teaching, parenting, it's all in a model of what I would call the fix-it model or the medical model. Basically, something's wrong with you and you need to fix it. You need to cure it. You go to a golf pro, he looks at your swing, you're doing something wrong, and you know whether it's the angle of your take back or what your grip, whatever it is, and they will give you, the coach, the teacher, the pro will give you a prescriptive instruction. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because what I believe is that a much more powerful model, which I think would take care of this is growing capacity, putting more attention and focus on growing our, our inner capacities. And you can do that. You can, for instance, I mentioned almost jokingly in the beginning, meditation. Mm -hmm. Meditation has been an absolute godsend practice for me. It has noticeably changed my central nervous system made it more relaxed, given me deep uh, experiences of peace and just relaxation, like as a reference point. So like I actually didn't realize how chronically stressed I was. And so growing this capacity to just, you know, meditate 20 minutes in the morning every day, over time, it really has paid off. <laughs> Um, so it's like what other, you know, what other practices, what other capacities can we, can we build so that we actually prepare ourselves f to receive? Because that's ultimately what, is ha what I believe has happened is that the way we think about ourselves, sometimes it's really hard to receive the bounties of life. Mm. I would love to talk to like your entrepreneurs, for instance, and like when they get a million dollars funding, how many of them actually become successful and then how many like can't believe they've gotten the money. Yeah. And it just goes against their whole like, wow, like now I've got it. So for instance, last thing is um, that I think this pertains to is it's very well known the vast majority of people who win the lottery are broke in two years after winning the lottery they cannot receive it's too far beyond how they see themselves so it's like you were saying there it's okay the, the, the bank balance increases but the the paradigm the same they're still stuck in the same paradigm they're still stuck in the same you know uh way of thinking little mental kind of rituals or ways going and you you um a lot of the work you do is around this idea of the inner game and it, it's interesting we were speaking just before we started about how I, i've noticed a lot of uh performers artistic you know performers musicians artists um also people within entrepreneurship as well when i asked them like they're some of their, their favorite books 
the, one book that comes back time and time again is one of the books from the Inner Game series, which I know you're very much in, involved in as well. Like, whether it's the Inner Game of Golf or the Inner Game of Tennis. I believe I think it was an Inner Game of Music as well um, yes. that was written. And they said because when you're dealing with uh, the elite performers, and I'm going to I'm going to use elite in the positive term of of, of elites, people are really at the, the top of their game. It said so much of the the the, the training is very very sim is very very similar. They're, they're they're all doing the same things. You know, it's, you know the same rehearsals, practice routines, etc. So so much of it becomes down to that inner game, that mental model that they have for themselves as well. And and I'm wondering, you know, when you're you're talking with these people, these different people, you're, you're um, you know, whether it's these top tennis uh, stars or top leaders from business, how much are you trying to break down th- what they're, they're in a game in order to be able to kind of model it to help your clients? Um, well, I mean, that's you know, the inner game. First of all, the yeah, the inner game is. Um, like the inner game of tennis is really the classic. That's the one that usually people refer to. You know, there are the other inner game books, but that one was, you know, the first. And and it's 45 years old. It's amazing. It's 45 years old today. It's still selling like 30,000 copies a year. I mean, you know, most books don't even sell that. And it's 45 years later, it's still selling quite well. It's a very simple book about how to get the best out of yourself and others and how to get out of your own way, how to stop the self-interference and the sabotage. And ultimately, nobody really wants to admit it, but the injury is a self-sabotage. The injury is there's this internal pressure and it's intense and they and it's you can't they can't stand it. So like David Goffin, who's from Belgium, he's still he's ranked in the top twenty, but once he broke, he also had a tournament where he beat two two players in the top 10 and suddenly was ranked in the top 20. And in his own words, he fell on the court in a mysterious way and broke his right wrist. James, do you know how many pros in the last 30 years have fallen on the court and broken their wrist? Like nobody. I mean, you know, they're, they're so I'm pretty sure that it's this stuff that this stuff is, is subconscious. It's, it's that, that what has been offered and presented to you does not conform to how you see yourself. It creates this internal pressure. And so then you have to do something, and in most cases subconsciously, so that you return to normal. So you go back into your comfort zone. And so this is the thing. This is what I'm talking about, where what happens if you can help people grow capacity? So let me re- get back. The, the famous formula is that performance from the inner game is performance equals potential minus interference. So if you want to improve performance, you can grow potential or, which is often overlooked, you can do things, you can play the, quote, inner game, unquote, to you know, reduce the self-interference. And when you reduce self-interference, you get immediate impacts in, per- in performance. Growing potential takes a little time, but that's actually where I've, I've put my focus and energy is, is like what happens when we simplify the whole thing, we identify the three or four most critical elements that, that drive the performance that are just, you know, in tennis, it's the tennis ball. 45 years later, the same thing is true. Tracking the ball, reading and reacting to that tennis ball approaching you is the single most important uh, factor for playing well and learning. And it's still overlooked because people are in the fix-it model. The pros are looking at behavior. They're looking at the tip of the iceberg, which is the physical behavior or technique. But everything is happening below the surface, and it and they completely ignore it. So meanwhile, if you help somebody improve and grow their capacity to track the ball, um, which is the most important skill, then everything else gets better. Let me just share real quick. So what when I'm working in other sports and in business and if I was working with your creative types, the question I would ask is what's the tennis ball for you? And it's interesting because I mean I've just recently gone through and interviewed sixty of the world's best keynote speakers. And and like you've done with the tennis the great tennis players, 
they 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 come at it from different perspectives and they've had different upbringings, different trainings, and 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 different things as well. But there are patterns um, within that, um, and some of it involves. But one of the one of the key ones is those in their their tennis balls, um, which is basically ninety eight percent of of speaking is getting the gig. <laughs> getting the speaking gig that's right. the they, they they spend a huge amount of time and focus on how, on how to do that and then there's there's the other things from there so it's just kind of I, 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 as you say it's kind of identifying what those those three things are so in in your own work can you talk about maybe a time when you had a an insight or a light bulb moment and you went oh okay this is the kind of work i want to be focusing on or this was a, like a key paradigm shift for yourself um, yeah, there's probably a couple. Um, one thing, the way you phrased it, that comes to mind, which started me on this whole path that I'm that I'm talking to you about today, about you know the importance of focusing on what's critical, growing capacity. Um, I was uh, referred to Pete Carroll. So for those of your audience that don't know Pete Carroll, he um, was the head football coach at USC. Um, for nine, almost 10 years and won two national championships, played for a third and then became the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. And within a, a four or five years, he, he's, you know, he won the Super Bowl like three years and he's made the playoffs every year. So he, he's really, um, you know, one of the better coaches he's figured it out you know, how to have sustainable high performance. And I got referred to him the year before he got the SC job. And he, he uh, believed that the inner game was the foundation of his coaching philosophy. So he hired me to help him flesh out like the inner game part. And he hired a football guy to help him because he discovered that he, he really thought that he didn't know why he got fired. He got fired from the New York Jets and the New England Patriots the previous two times he had a head coach opportunity. And he didn't really know why. So he thought that he needed to know his coaching philosophy really well. So we met and we, for lunch and he told me why he wanted to meet and why he wanted to work with me. And I said, so, well, let's start right now. And, you know, so tell me what you what's your belief about peak performance, which that's the term even today, like Accenture, you know, uh, high performance delivered. It's all about high performance or peak performance. And, uh, and he said, well, the first thing I need to tell you is that I don't believe in peak performance. So like that was like a shocker to me. I mean, even today, like, this is the, you know, what I now know, he's one of the most competitive men on the planet. You know? <laughs> and so for him, him to say that, and then what happened afterwards, where I said, well, you know, that's like, wow, that is provocative. I mean, tell me more. And he said, well, you know, peak performance is about performing well, like for like a specific moment or period of time. But what I, I believe in it in attaining what we now would call sustainable high performance he didn't say that but he said high levels of performance that can not only be maintained over time but improved upon and grown and that was a different model that's the development model hmm. peak performance kind of comes out of the fix it model where you assume that you're going to play poorly one day and poor and and well the next. So you train in such a way that you peak for a particular event like the Olympics. But what happens when you have 16 football games? Yeah. So I, know, it's, it's, it's almost like, I mean, I think as you're saying this, it's almost, um, if you take the music industry, for example, you have uh, artists, I'd fortunately meet Amy Winehouse, you could argue a peak performer went up very high and, Mm. Crashed and very, very low and had terrible, you know, ter terrible that we we lost her. And then you have bands like U two, <laughs> who are what you would call the sustainable high performers. Every year they're out there, or they're pretty much every year they're out there, bigger and bigger audiences all the time. Continue, as you say, building capacity, uh, continually mm. building capacity as well. They, they're very different ways of thinking, ways of building a building a business and building a building a life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on on that note, um, 
uh, we were just kind of talking about as you were talking about kind of building capacity, and you mentioned uh, mindfulness and meditation. Are, are there any kind of um, tools or online resources or, or mobile apps? I know you know uh, things like Headspace are really big now, and, and, and mindfulness and meditation. Uh, are there any apps that you find very useful for your, your practice, or you sometimes advise to, to clients? Um, you know, to be honest, uh, there isn't. However, like two of my recent clients, because I brought to them meditation and they are into apps and I wish I knew the exact name of it, but it is off of their Apple watch. And, um, and it's a, it's, it, it's almost funny, but it's, it's a breathing app. It's an app that will come on at any time you, you designate during the day for one minute and it pulsates on the person's wrist. So you don't have to like, once it pulses, you know, that that's your, what it is and you don't have to look because it'll pulse for a full minute and it just you know the the idea is that in that in those moments you will then become present you will stop thinking you will stop what you're doing you'll feel the vibration and, and the pulsing on your wrist and you'll just bring your attention to your breath and both of my clients have said that it's just been worked really wonderful in helping them stay more relaxed and calm and less stressed during the day, more present. They feel like they're not only more productive, but actually like, come, you know, they're able to problem solve much better coming from that more relaxed uh, focused state. And they each described the one minute as seemingly lasting 10 minutes. It just seems <laughs> like it's forever. So uh, that's the only app that comes to mind, you know, but anything like that that can help and someone become more present during the day, I think is a good thing. And if you could only recommend one book and, and one record, one album to our listeners, what would they be? Um, well, I think, I mean, I think the book has to be The Inner Game of Tennis. It's still, it, it's such a simple and well-written and it, you know, it, it's just, it's still the best. It was the first sports psychology book really ever, but certainly the most popular one ever written. And it's still the best to this day. I mean, there's it, nobody that's, that's why I haven't even written my own. I mean, it's like, why bother? It's, it's like so good. <laughs> Um, seriously. So, and then, um, uh, record when I saw that, uh, you know, I know it'll sound funny, but, uh, Steve Martin getting small, <laughs> if you're gonna, you know, you, you gotta laugh, you know, life can be pretty tough, James. So, you know, if there was only one record, I, I, at the moment I would say, you know, Steve Martin's Getting Small, which still to this day makes me laugh my head off. Well, so. we'll put that down as well. Finally, um, Sean, let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of your trade and the knowledge you have acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You don't know anyone. You have to restart. What would you do to restart? Oh, so that's interesting because that's, you know, I, I got a heads up on that. On uh, But the idea that nobody knows me, so that, mm. that actually creates a wrinkle because I've had to restart a couple of different times. In the 2008 collapse, I, 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 I like was so happy. I mean, I had GE, ITT, Union. I mean, I was doing very well. I've never seen anything like it. It all went away within two weeks, like within two weeks. I had, you know, <laughs> I could go on about what I the, what was on the table, but uh, everything was off the table and I literally had to start over. But what I did have was I still had my resume. If I had to start over and nobody knew me, then that would be simple. That would be... Um, to go and give as many talks as I could in the area that I wanted to become known in and to develop clients in. Uh, talks is, uh, in terms of growing a business, because that's essentially what you're now describing, is that I've got my craft. I'm, and uh, talks, I think, is the, the, the best, one of the best ways of generating uh, exposure and and new clients because they're hearing you 
they're getting an experience of you. They're hearing your philosophy. They're hearing your story. They're hearing, you know, how you help somebody. Um, so even if they don't know you, something starts to resonate it within them, and you know, you can you can start being in touch with those people. And um, so that would probably, I mean, that would be the the number one thing. So I'm guessing I'm guessing people listening to this, there'll be many whether they're entrepreneurs or, or artists or musicians or writers or or uh, working within the sciences that are listening to this just now saying I need someone like Sean on my side I need someone that helps me can help me with my inner game or my organizations my senior management's in inner game where's the best place for them to go to find out more about you and your work. Well, thanks for that. Um, the best place is my website, seanbrawley.com, S-E-A-N-B-R-A-W-L-E-Y.com. And they could also uh, reach out to me directly via email at uh, sean, S-E-A-N, at seanbrawley.com. Well, Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today about the the inner in a game and also what you were just saying there earlier about you know the hero's journey and i'm going to be thinking about it a lot as i as i see the things and have different conversations at the moment uh because i think you've 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 actually hit upon something there that that i think is very interesting so thank you so much for coming on today and and sharing uh some wonderful information and knowledge with our listeners thank you very much thank you james it was a pleasure hey james taylor here again And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.